brain training's are very popular in the, the real world at the moment. There's a lot of companies, games on the market to try and train up your brain. Um, but the evidence is still quite contentious about this. It's just like muscles in the body. The things that you do with your brain determine the size and shape of different areas of it. What we're trying to understand is how far it can go and also, importantly, is it a trade-off? So if you're improving some things, does that mean you're losing other things? So if you've got one of these little machines and you press buttons, that the more you press that button, the faster you get at pressing the button. That's great. The big question is, is getting better at pressing this button going to make you better at anything else in life that you'd like to be better at? And that's where we still really don't have much evidence um, to suggest that brain training is really going to make a big difference. You know, if, if you are losing other things, it might be that your brain training actually doesn't have a desirable result. Like going to the gym and doing the wrong exercise. Well, no, it's not quite like that with exercise, is it? Because it's not like you only have a limited amount of muscle in your body and so, you know, if I build up my arm muscles, my leg muscles are going to get weaker. That's not the case. But it may be the case with the brain because we have limited resources and there, there is some evidence that when you increase one thing, you lose other things. And I suppose a broader question is whether, um, whether this is the best way to engage the brain. We know it's a good idea to engage, but are these sort of games and training strategies the best way of doing it? Or would taking an evening class, reading a challenging book, would that be equally good? If you're, for instance, someone getting older and you're worried about um, deterioration in your brain, you're afraid you're losing some abilities, then it's, we think it would be very healthy for you to try learning some new things. So it's not about just doing the same things that you've already been doing for a long time, because that's not going to increase or strengthen anything, because you've already done that. You need to go and work on new things. And again, the parallel with muscles. Um, if you are already you know, running five miles a week or something, then running five miles a week isn't probably going to make that much difference to you, but it would be better for you to start doing sit-ups. But if, if you'd never run before, then, then you're going to build some new muscles if you do that. I would say there's a, a, a slight, a possible area where there is some potential, and that's in the area of increasing working memory um, and helping perhaps people with some forms of dyslexia and learning deficits where working memory is a fundamental limitation. That there does seem to be some evidence, and I, I'm not too surprised that there is, that we can actually, through steady and repeated training, increase people's working memory a little bit so that they can store that working memory is that kind of short-term memory, the kind of memory we're using at the moment for an interaction. So it's the kind of storing of information that you want to use at any point in time. Like RAM in a computer. Like RAM in a computer, exactly. So you want to store that, you want to store this because you're processing it because it's fundamental to what you're doing. Certainly for particular conditions where we know that people have got a very specific difficulty with one cognitive process like memory or attention, training might be much better, but it's certainly there's not any strong evidence that just an everyday person who trains a lot using some kind of computerised battery will improve a great deal. But it could help people who have kind of a very specific problem and that's been targeted. But for ordinary um, people, everyday people's needs, to think that somehow doing little things like that will keep you or will make your, your brain stronger or better, I think is, it, that is a myth. It's possible that for the elderly again, not so much doing silly things like pressing flashing buttons, but perhaps doing crosswords, things that keep... Um, keep us searching in our brains for the meanings of words, the use of different kinds of words, some kind of basic verbal problem solving. So those kinds of things may well be very useful for us as we age. You think about the brain more than most people. You, you've studied it, you work mm -hmm. on it. Do you do anything to care for your brain or to look after your brain that perhaps I don't do or the average person does? Do you do anything extra because of that awareness you have? I don't think I can think of anything specific. Do I do anything yeah, for my what brain? What do you do to care for your brain? Maybe I don't do. 
Mm, well, that's a really good question. Um, I don't do anything explicit. I don't sit around and think, oh, what could I do to, um, you know, to build up my Heschel's gyrus or increase my motor cortex or something. You, you of all people must know how important the brain is. Is there nothing we can do to, you know, we go to the gym to look after our bodies and things like that. Is there anything we can do for our brain? Um, potentially, um, there's a lot of work recently on the benefits of mindfulness meditation. So that could be the equivalent of um, the sort of TLC that one might give to one's body to also give to one's mind. And actually, I'll tell you one thing that I did for my brain, now, now you ask, is uh, we did a, I did a study a couple of years ago about social group sizes um, and, and the brain. And what we, it was very simple. We just got people to write down um, how many social contacts they'd had in the last week. Uh, so this is not work contacts, but just write down the initials of everyone that you've actually spoken to socially. It could be email, it could be phone, whatever. And then we looked to see whether that predicted anything about their brain. You wouldn't think it would, but it did. Amazingly, it predicted the volume of several different areas in the brain, notably one that's um, called the orbitofrontal cortex, so it's kind of right under here, um, above the eyes. And people who had more social contacts had more volume in that area. And as a you know, fairly anti-social scientist with a limited uh, number of contacts, it made me really think, gosh, I'd better get out there and make sure that at least that every day I talk to one or two people socially and help to maybe strengthen up those circuits and improve my social abilities. I wouldn't go so far as to say, you know, we know for sure this works, but it's that kind of correlation that's interesting. That's the only one I can think of that I've really applied to my life.